All right, well, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Thank you everyone for joining us for our October Equinox Focus event on the landscape of business transactions. For those of you who have been thinking about selling your business, this has probably been top of mind. How has the current economic environment, the current uh, pandemic environment impacted business transactions? Um, and we are fortunate today to have Rasan Freeman of Freeman Lunt. Um, they are a sell side uh, business broker or business representative advising companies on um, the sale of their business, primarily in the small and lower middle market um, areas. So we're really excited to have them share kind of what they're seeing in the, the marketplace at this time. A couple of housekeeping items before we, we jump in full board. Uh, first, we are recording this event, and so this will be posted on our YouTube channel um, following the event. We will also be sending out copies of that link, uh, the slides, and any uh, responses to questions that we're not able to answer today during the program. So those of you who are in attendance will get that email um, either today or tomorrow um, that provides that summary. Um, if you do have questions during the program, please feel free to pop those into either the Q&A or the chat function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to tackle those as we can, but if not, again, it will be included in the materials uh, that will follow up to the program. So with that, I wanna make sure that we get the most out of our guest speaker today. So Rasan, I will let you take it away. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us for the uh, landscape of business transaction discussion here. As Michelle mentioned, we're a sales side advisory firm. Uh, we help folks transition out of their companies, but also help them grow through acquisition. And believe it or not, people are doing that right now. So <clears throat> we're gonna go through these slides fairly quick today. So we have more time to cover case studies and answer questions. We found that our audiences typically find a lot of value in discussing transactions that are happening in now time. With that being said, let's get started. Back in April, we uh, were tasked to speak on you know, a similar um, presentation and what was happening at the time with this pandemic. And so we're gonna do a quick recap of 2020 and, and what we saw back then leading up to today. In April, 2020, we had this new pandemic called COVID-19. Some people thought it was the end of the world. In our opinion, we thought it was the next business life cycle for your business. <clears throat> At the time, these were some of the hard hit industries. Uh, I'm sure some of this will seem very obvious to you. Uh, air travel, hotels, restaurants. Anybody tried to go to Hawaii in the last uh, four or five months? It's been pretty difficult, right? They've been uh, levied with strict you know, regulation and um, sometimes it shut down even. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. We've seen a number of businesses pivot and increase revenues. For instance, uh, a manufacturer we ran into that working in linens and switched over to masks. Their revenue is booming now. These are some of the questions on business owners' minds during that time of uncertainty. Uh, the negatively impacted folks. How am I going to pay rent? What's going to happen to my employees? How long is this going to last? Is there any help available for me? On the inverse, the folks that have positive impacts. How am I gonna scale during these operations? How long will this last again? Is there financing available to help me grow my company? We're gonna be answering a number of these questions as we go through these slides and finish this presentation today. These questions are parallel with what we've seen over the past 20 years from similar pains that have hit the US economy. We've overcome them all. COVID is just the newest issue to address. Everybody remembers Y2K, SARS, and most recently, the Great Recession. If the past has taught us anything, it's that things are cyclical. Earlier this year, we saw that there was a prediction across a wide set of economic minds about what is happening now has in similar fashion happened before. As I mentioned earlier, things are cyclical. On this chart above, you notice the V. That's the economy's growth taking a large drop in the shaded recessionary area and coming back up. You see something similar in the shaded area for 2002 SARS, 1968 Hong Kong flu, and again in the 1958 Asian flu and the 1918 Spanish flu. Credit Suisse, a premier global investment bank and investment wealth manager, showed us in March that here's what they expected. 
regarding the V. Notice anything familiar? June was what they saw as the back to baseline timeframe for us. You see a similar upward trajectory from a negative to a positive as it related to China and the world from Goldman Sachs analysts in this chart. And Wells Fargo US economic forecast painted a similar bounce back, albeit a little bit later in the year, Q4 in their opinion. So here's what we thought, and our emojis say it all. <laughs> At the, the beginning here, the first three months, we got the poop emoji, not a fun time. The next three to 12 months, which is what we're experiencing now, difficult, right? Losing sleep, trying to figure out how do I navigate through this craziness and this time of uncertainty. But in the long run, two years plus from, and this is back you know, in springtime, the sunshine's back out, we got the shades on, we're enjoying good times. At the end of the day, this is a very typical cycle of most recessions. You got to break out your recessionary toolkit and get to work. So what do market trends look like now? If you add some most recent history to the Credit Suisse forecast, you will notice that the market has been improving in line with market research and analysts and analysis from March. You can see that at the beginning of June, we're back to where we started the year. The stock market tries to predict the next three to six months. As you can see, there's that deep V we discussed earlier, bottoming out in March. China has bounced back faster than the US in the comparative graphs of stock indices. But the important part of this trajectory, the V so keenly predicted to positive growth has appeared. Recent weakness in growth remains from the fear of a double dip with the advent of school beginning and flu season. So how does this pandemic impact anyone wanting to sell their business? It's gonna change how you feel about transition. People have to move up their time horizon, retire later. They're closing their doors, finding something else to do. Or they're one of the lucky ones that made a pivot or they were essential and have decided to keep making hand sanitizers and masks. The spectrum is wide, but the majority of businesses, about 75% of the makeup of the S&P 500 are tied to the economy and cyclical industries. So that means when the economy recedes, so does their profit level. As such, most companies, small and large, are under pressure to perform and or stay open as opposed to imagining growth For those still in transition, the transition can look very different from what they imagined in 2018. What do business transactions look like in the current market? One word will sum it all up. Creative. We're improving overall as an economy in the United States, but there are still ripples in the bond from COVID and uncertainties that exist. For instance, having access to capital is a big deal when it comes to having more buyers. If financing wasn't available, your buyer pool is going to shrink. Part of having success in selling your company is having a large pool of buyers. The more, the better. To compete in today's environment, there's a high probability that your buyer is going to need bank financing, but working capital, and also to purchase the business. SBA uh, is doing a high percentage of those deals. However, banks are conservative by nature. They're publicly traded entities with shareholders to answer to. To access financing in an economic downturn with a global pandemic, you need to be able to help the bank navigate your industry with factual data that they can understand. One way is to lower their exposure. We're seeing more earnouts, profit sharing, seller vehicles, as well as extended seller training times to bridge the short-term value gap between buyers, sellers, and banks. <clears throat> These tools will help a buyer feel more comfortable and a bank feel more comfortable about the business they're buying or financing. That is gonna be what you proposed it will be. If you have extreme confidence in your plan and the business you have known for the past 10, 20, 30 years, and that it can weather this storm, they're gonna ask you to walk that mile with them. Your buyer is, just, is usually just getting to know your business. Extended periods of seller training assistance can go a long way with confidence for a bank and a buyer. Banks apply less risk to a company in transition if the current seller slash owner is going to be sticking around for up to a year. Buyers find comfort in this too. Uncertainty equals risk. And risk usually translates into a lower value to compensate for that risk. The end result is a lower price or undesirable terms for you as a seller because your business is deemed risky. 
It is in your best interest to outline your ideal outcome. At the same time, be sensitive to the concerns of, of your buying pool to maximize your value. So how do you consider next steps if you had a loss in revenue? Well, it's not the end of the world. Another way to reduce risk to banks and buyers is to prepare and, and tell and document your journey. It won't be enough to have, one, have someone believe you. They gotta verify. Inspect what you expect, trust but verify are two popular phrases we hear in the banking world. Be ready to verify your story to a buyer and that buyer's lender. Be ready to show your performance year over year, but more importantly, month over month compared to last year or even the year before. The more granular detail you can be ready to provide to show the impact of COVID and how you are overcoming the challenge will be instrumental to bank financing for a buyer. If not, a bank's gonna to wanna to look at your year-end numbers. This means that they're gonna to wanna to see how you have overcome any financial deterioration from 20 to 21. How does that impact your sale? And now moves it into 2022 because the bank's gonna to wanna to see your year-end financials and tax return. Although the market's been improving, the double dip effect is on everybody's mind from COVID moving into the fall. Having a double dip in a recession can be emotionally and financial, financially trying. Imagine March, April, and May all over again. Now that you have that experience, how would you approach it differently? What would you change to realize success sooner? It's important to look at what has worked and what has not during the past few months in your own business. Whether we take a step back or not, the following tips are important to move ahead. For those things that have worked, continue to improve and refine. For those that didn't, and I can't stress this one enough, brainstorm with your advisors, industry peers, or firms like ourselves to find your opportunities for success. So this is a big one. Document, document, and document. Whether you're doing good or not. Be ready to face buyer concessions with more seller financing, extended seller training, or value gap tools such as burnouts and profit sharing. And adjust your time horizon. You may not sell until COVID is all done. So we moved quickly through that information and this is where we feel the bulk of learning comes you know, for our audience. And we're gonna talk about some case studies. And at this point in time also, Michelle, if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, shoot those my way and we'll answer them the best we can. But, you know, some of the, some of the questions we brought up earlier were, uh, you know, concerns for people that are being negatively impacted by COVID and how they're gonna survive. What do I do if I'm losing revenue? Well, here's an example. Uh, we got a company that's been losing money the last two years, and I think they might show a nominal profit this year. And they had some folks uh, come to them and, and talk about investing in their business. They have a, a very you know, big upward trend if things go their way. And they were gonna give away 30% of their company to take in equity from a group to, to get working capital to grow. We looked at their balance sheet and income statements and, and said, you know what? We think you're financeable. And they said, how? We see that we've been losing money the last two, three years. I don't think a bank is gonna to wanna to touch us. Remember we said earlier about document, document, document. These guys documented very well. Um, they were in a very unique industry that um, is poised for, for strong growth. And uh, we were able to get them about a million dollars uh, from a bank and now they actually have opportunity to grow through acquisition. Uh, we've targeted another company for them that if they end up making this purchase is gonna significantly boost their bottom line. It's gonna make the bank feel even better about lending them money and where they sit today moving forward and possibly extend them even more working capital uh, you know, for other acquisitions. But these are things that weren't even on these, these business owners' minds. They were just trying to figure out how do we weather the storm? How are we gonna make rent? How do we take care of our employees? And it's turning out very well for them. Are there any questions at the moment right now, Michelle? Nope, not yet. Okay, I'll continue. Another company, uh, we've got buyers looking at a business that's in distribution. And they've had a, a, a good trend leading up to COVID and now sales are down. Company's still good and it can be scaled by these particular buyers. And what they're doing is they're going to purchase the receivables of this business, which I want to say are a couple hundred thousand dollars. And when you buy receivables in an asset purchase as a buyer, you get them unencumbered, meaning you don't pay the taxes on those receivables. The seller does. And so the buyers are going to get these receivables. That's some of their working capital right away. The bank, um, I think through SBA, is giving them about 
three to four hundred thousand dollars in permanent working capital, and they're going to get a three to four hundred thousand dollar operating line of credit. So walking in the door, they're going to have anywhere from seven hundred thousand dollars in the low end to a million dollars of permanent working capital. They literally can can pay themselves back their down payment week one after taking over the business and still have plenty of money left over to grow and scale the business. How are deals like this getting done? It, it goes back to what you know we mentioned earlier in some of the slides. Having very good documentation, being able to understand what's going on at an industry, what their COVID plan is, what your COVID plan is as a buyer, and, and this matters for any of you that are thinking about selling in the not too distant future. As we mentioned earlier, you're gonna need to be able to help these buyers and banks understand how this company is still going to continue and be successful moving forward in this great time of uncertainty. It really comes down to telling the story and making it make sense. Scott and I, we were in the banking industry for 20 plus years of peace. And one thing that helped us achieve a lot of success and close deals was not trying to sell um, people on the deal, especially your underwriters, but being able to logically outline the risk and how you would mitigate them. So if you're an industry that, you know, is, is in um, food, for instance, restaurant, and you got hit hard by COVID, <clears throat> what have you done since then? Did you, did you adapt? Did you change? Were you flexible and nimble enough to move to a takeout model, like you've seen for some companies that now are doubling their bottom line uh, post-COVID because they don't have as much fixed expense they've moved to that full-on takeout model and are rocking and rolling. And some of these, these restaurants are, are going to continue that long-term and, and may move to that model full-on. Other folks that have figured out, like uh, Twitter, for instance, saying no more going to the office permanently. Everyone is going to work from home now. 100% virtual model. Imagine the amount of fixed expense they've reduced uh, or overhead in, in their, uh, their lease expense putting a bunch more money back to their bottom line. I mean, these are just some of the things that are happening that we're seeing companies, you know, adjust and pivot and, and make positive changes to navigate all this COVID craziness. We've got another owner that was going to sell and she had a very successful business. It still does actually, and wanted to get a certain number, but same thing, she's had some impact from COVID. And after outlining everything that's going on, um, she, she's starting to really document everything now, line it up uh, very well for a buyer and a bank to be able to get behind financing her business when it is time for her to sell. And the reason why she's waiting is she wants to realize a higher number. If you're okay with whatever that number is today, um, being it could be greatly reduced from a buyer coming in, not knowing how to navigate the uncertainty in the world, well, it's okay to move ahead, but that's not the case, I think, for most sellers. Obviously, you want to try to maximize the value. And these are key in helping you do that. Any, uh, any questions yet so far? No, I don't see any in the chat yet. All right, we've got a, we've got a quiet group. <laughs> um, we'll go over some more case studies that maybe will help resonate with folks. <clears throat> we had another group that um, wanted to sell their business that was in the, the gym and fitness world. It was more toward gymnastics for kids. Obviously, they, they got shut down for a while, and now they're, they're operating, but operating at um, significantly reduced clients. Not so many kids can come into the gym. So buyer came to the table, seller you know, understood there was gonna probably be a, a big hit to the value because of the massive uncertainty in the industry, but it still worked for them. You know, once we penciled it all out, uh, the numbers still allowed them to transition and they were okay with taking that hit now and didn't want to stay in for the long term. They were older, didn't know how long this was going to go on, which you know, none of us do, and decided to take that exit. Uh, the buyers were able to, to move it into a different space at a reduced you know, lease expense and continue business, and, and they're already growing. Uh, they've adapted their business model to it and have already uh, been able to book out a number of, of classes that the previous owner wasn't able to. So there are deals getting done. You got to be able to think outside the box. And I mentioned it earlier. I can't stress this enough. Talk to your advisors. That's legal, banking, 
wealth management, anybody thinking about transitioning, you know, you know that liquidity event, is this the, the last thing you're going to do? Are you going to be, be retired and be done? Or are you going to move into another business? Or one of the things that is not on a lot of business owners' minds is that growth by acquisition. You may have been thinking about selling, but this could be the prime time for you to grow and capture market share. Uh, another case study, we have a company that is buying out two competitors and the buyer is the weakest link at the table, but because the other two sellers who happen to want to get out at the same time are, are strong and have great uh, backlogs and whips for work in progress, the bank is getting comfortable with letting the minnow swallow the whale is what we like to call it in the banking world. They're going to be able to finance the acquisition of purchasing these two competitors and now, you know, triple their revenues and, and who knows uh, what the transition will look like for them potentially in a few years if they decide to, to exit or stay. But the opportunity for growth by acquisition is big right now. You're just seeing consolidations, you know, all, all over the place across many different industry landscapes. And again, this uncertainty has created opportunity. And in any recessionary period, there's always opportunities. You just have to have your radar. And, and although selling and getting out of the business may have been top of mind at the moment for a number of sellers moving into 2020, if they've got the wherewithal and, and, want to, and are okay with sticking around for another few years and getting through COVID and seeing what businesses look like after that, um, acquiring may be a great opportunity for them to take advantage of. Any questions or things um, on your side, Michelle, that um, you know are relevant to some of these case studies in this discussion that you want to talk about? Yeah, so I was thinking um, we are still seeing a lot of deals, you know, marching forward um, with you know limited changes. You mentioned the creativity. I think you know certainly buyers are are taking a second look and really kind of trying to understand what is the economic engine behind behind that business. But are you seeing folks walking away from deals that are in progress? And what are the kind of circumstances around those types of situations? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, when you're investigating the business and you're starting to do your due diligence and you start to get pretty far down the path and financial things come up, right? Where uh, we have one, one seller who has been, he's got all this excess inventory and he has no uh, backlog um, you know, for that inventory to move. Where pre-COVID, things were just happening. And I think he was just going with the flow in his particular industry. He wasn't doing anything special. I think everybody in his industry had a lot of positive trends and they were all just kind of riding the wave. But this is where we find that you know, having everything documented, understanding the direction your business can go and how to help a buyer and a bank get comfortable uh, with this deal is huge. And this particular seller has not done that. And when we're asking him, okay, um, we need to explain the dip in revenue. And, you know, is this just a blip on the radar? Is this going to be something, you know, moving forward into 2020? You know, how, what are you doing to, to navigate this? He doesn't, his, his only explanation is, oh, well, you know, I, I can't say anything for certain. It's COVID, right? And with the election, I mean, you know, we, we just don't know. Well, how do you think that makes a bank or a buyer feel <laughs> about purchasing a business? It's not giving them a lot of confidence in that company moving forward. And now what are they going to do? They're probably going to sit back. They're going to want to see how you finish out 2020. And now moving into 2021, if he doesn't make some kind of change to to add a bunch of revenue um, to the bottom, you know, to the top and bottom, his value is going to be drastically impacted. And he's now either going to have to probably stick around for another few years because in banking, if somebody's going to get financing, a bank looks at your last three years. And if your most recent year is a loss, you better have a very good explanation for why and why it's not going to continue and be the same moving into the next year. And if you can't explain that, more than likely, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill financing for that buyer or drastically reduce it, which again, will more than likely kill the deal. Yeah, so I think that's interesting. You know, you're, you're talking about uncertainty and you're talking about 
the different audiences who need to have that confidence. So it's not just the buyer. The buyer may love you and think that this is the best <coughs> thing since sliced bread, um, but the bank is going to have a kind of different view on those numbers and on that due diligence. And so the story needs to be um, needs to resonate with both of those audiences. Exactly. And banks are very conservative by nature. Like I, you know, we mentioned earlier in the slides, they uh, a lot of times are looking for ways. Uh, for reasons not to do a deal <laughs> instead of ways to try and make the deal work. Luckily, you know, we've been fortunate enough in our 20 plus years to build a network of bankers that think uh, more on the latter. They're, they're trying to figure out ways to make these deals happen. Like for that company I mentioned earlier, it's had consecutive years of losses. That's not, it doesn't always kill the deal. If you can explain things and show them and document why, there's a reason for that and, and why the trend is going to be positive moving forward, a bank can get behind it. You know, as long as you're not trying to sell them on it. And like I said, outlining the, the risks, if you know what the risks are in your business, which I'm sure most of the audience does, you've been running these, these companies for many years, I think you're gonna have a pretty good idea of how to mitigate it. But if you have been running it for years, like the gentleman I mentioned earlier, and you don't have any kind of explanation outside of, oh, well, I mean, it's the market, right? <laughs> That's not gonna work. Yeah, so we have a question here. Um, you know, what about businesses that had a great 2020 due to COVID? Um, is it fair to look at 2020 as an outlier in establishing enterprise value? Definitely, and and again, depends on your buyer and you know, are you synergistic? Is it somebody that's going to come in and just want to operate it like you have? That can be, you know, value is subjective, right? And in banking terms, uh, companies that all of a sudden are booming. Uh, the, the manufacturer I mentioned earlier, when they, they flipped the masks, revenues went from, I think, in the 3 million range to 7 or 8 million and uh, are turning to, to be 10 million and plus moving into the next year. And now they're interested in selling <laughs> because they want to try and capture that value. But if I'm buying it and I'm looking at it and, and I go, okay, I'm going to finance this with bank, number one as a buyer, how do I know that that's going to continue? What is this thing really going to look like in and level out to, uh, we don't know uh, what COVID is gonna look like moving into the future, but if you think of 9-11, and any of you who flew pre-9-11, and then tried to immediately within a year fly post-9-11, very different experiences, right? So I, I look at this uh, very similar when it comes to this pandemic. You know, we ratchet down really hard one way in the beginning, trying to get a hold on this and figure out, okay, what are all the measures we need to have in place? How, how our business is going to have to be regulated now and large gatherings and, and you name it. Um, there's so many things that we're still trying to figure out um, from an operational standpoint. And then medically, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, still, all these uncertainties with COVID moving into the future, we don't know. So when you look at a company that now has flipped to making masks and are, are booming, is it safe to say that'll continue for a while? Probably, but, you know, but uh, we just don't know. So banks, again, when you're talking to, to conservative folks, you have to figure out how, how do I get them comfortable with this? And when you're, you're looking at a company like that, if you're owning and operating it now, and you're thinking about selling in the not, not too distant future, document, right? Start putting the stuff together that's gonna tell your story and your journey, how you navigated COVID, how you've set this company up for positive growth moving into the future and, and uh, continued success. Right? If you can do that, that is going to drastically help your buyers outside of the private equity groups that are coming in and, and cutting checks. I mean, you know, they're usually not looking at companies until you're upwards of a $3 million EBITDA and, and above. But if you are in that space, you know, it might be a little bit different, but still the things we talk about are still going to be extremely valuable for helping buyers be comfortable with your business, helping banks be comfortable you know, with that business moving forward and help you as a seller maximize value uh, moving forward when you want to exit. Did I answer that question? Or any follow-ups to that one? I don't see a follow-up yet, so we'll see if it follows up. Um, in the meantime, I was thinking, um, he says, thank you. In the meantime, I was thinking um, about how the banks look at, at financing. Do you, do you have a sense that 
bank financing algorithms have changed somewhat or how they evaluate an opportunity has changed at all in order to accommodate for these these different financial scenarios? Sure, and, and if anything, they, they just take a deeper look. At the end of the day, there's, there's three things that I want the audience to take away when it comes to banking, how banks work. I used to teach this to my bankers. Three words, LLC, leverage, liquidity, coverage. <clears throat> how much debt can the, can the company sustain? You know, uh, in the short term, what's their liquidity look like? And then how can they, they uh, um, service the, the debt ongoing, you know, monthly? You know, so in leverage, the first L uh, in, in that equation, most banks want to see you at three to one or less. Some industries can be much higher. I've seen manufacturers eight to one, and that's acceptable for their particular industry. Banks will benchmark your company and, and see how they sit against the industry. If the industry is levered five to one and you're two to one, you're looking really good. Uh, if you're eight to one when the industry is five to one, not so hot, right? So in, in the leverage world, for every dollar of net worth you have, if they want you levered three to one or less, that means you can have three dollars of debt. I have a million in net worth, three million of dollars of debt in the balance sheet is, is an acceptable risk. It doesn't mean that you can't go over that and still get deals done, but you better have a good story. That liquidity is my short-term working capital needs. You know, it's usually uh, 1.5 to one. For every dollar of current liabilities, I better have a dollar fifty of current assets. You know, this is going to include your cash and your receivables, and then your debt service coverage. Uh, banks have different, you know, uh, ratios, but they all tend to fall somewhere in between one point one to to one point two five. For every dollar of debt I have, I better have a dollar ten or a dollar twenty five cash flow to to cover that. Those things are constant in banking. It doesn't matter when the economy is doing this, they're always going to have those measures. Now they start to dig into things like tangible net worth and, and different ratios or quick ratio and other things. Again, depending on the industry, if you can remember LLC, leverage liquidity coverage, those are our three constants in the banking world that they're always going to look at. And in any recessionary period, they're just going to, you know, um, have a, a, a closer lens when they're inspecting these businesses and how they want to lend on them. They might look a little closer, you know, they, they might not go outside the box as much, right? But as I mentioned earlier, um, another constant in banking is they want to see two, two out of the last three years are profitable with the most year being profitable. I just outlined a deal to you earlier where a company had two consecutive years of loss and they haven't finished this year trending, you know, uh, trending well, looking like they're going to have a, a positive cash flow at the end of the year, but the bank was still able to get comfortable with this deal. And like I said, these these owners were looking at taking on equity partners and giving away 30% of their company. Getting a bank loan was, was the furthest thing from their mind. And when we sat down and looked at their balance sheet making statements and said, hey, you know, I, I think you can get some leverage on this company. And they said, oh, no, no way, no bank would touch us. And long story short, here, here they are. They just got their million dollar proposal the other day from the bank and now they're working through getting that deal closed. And we're teaming, you know, teaming them up for an acquisition that uh, is going to add a significant amount of cash flow to their bottom line, all financeable still, and is going to make the bank even more comfortable about taking the risk in that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so universal that, you know, it, it's not as though one particular aspect of the deal can just sort of say, well, I'm, I'm going to ignore those, those facts. Um, Another area that has also come up recently in deals that we've been working on is uh, PPP funds. Um, because, you know, many of these are asset purchases, um, you know, the PPP loans are in the name of the selling company. Um, we don't know yet what the forgiveness process or timeline will look like, at least for most companies at this point. And so it's not something that, you know, either can reasonably be acquired, um, but the banks seem to still want that notice of the sale and the liability still sort of sits on the books of the selling company. Um, so that's been a kind of an interesting conversation that we've had with um, sellers and buyers about how do we protect against, you know, non-forgiveness, for instance, of those, of those funds. Have you guys seen any conversations around that? Lots. 
uh, it's funny. So we, we closed the deal in, in April we were in the construction related industry. And the the buyer, the sell the buyers asked the seller to apply for PPP and they wanted that as part of their working capital moving into uh, taking over this deal. And he did um, apply for PPP, got that money available, and, and he received the funds, I think, just a few days before closing, because we just didn't know what the timing was going to be. And what we had to do in that scenario was contact the current bank to do the PPP and figure out what their process was at the time, which uh, back in the springtime, there was no process. <laughs> Everybody was like, oh, we don't know. We just get this money in, and I don't know how we transition. Long story short, um, it stayed with the company. They just had to do some paperwork on the back end, and it was able to move over to those buyers, and now it's on their books. And they have to go through the forgiveness process. Fast forward to today, we're just now starting to get emails from different banks on what their process could look like. We still don't know exactly what that's going to be, but uh, I, I've seen uh, some verbiage that said, hey, anything under $50,000 in PPP, it's going to be a real quick and streamlined process. Some have moved that to 150000 or less, and they're going to you know, try to make it very simple. It's a, it's a moving target. You know, We just don't know. But from... Uh, I think it was from an accounting standpoint, uh, one of the CPAs we work with at SUNY Conrad in the summertime sent us a thing that said, uh, hey, if anybody is purchasing a company that has or hasn't applied for PPP, they could have gone in, applied for PPP after the acquisition, and as long as they didn't make big material changes to the business uh, and they were going to be running it business as usual, the, uh, the banks were going to look at that, that uh, PPP opportunity as if the, the business had been operation in an operation uh, for you know as long as the company they acquired. So if I bought a company today on an asset purchase, I just started my new entity and the other business was alive for 20 years, they're going to treat me as if I was in business for 20 years. As long as I didn't make any material changes, I was able to either absorb the PPP that the previous owner acquired or I could have in turn applied right then and there and they were going to treat me the same way. Uh, I think moving forward, you know, there's lots of talks about the next round of PPP. You know, I know it's up for discussion, um, you know, with, this, with the Senate and they're looking at passing bills and it's probably a strong likelihood that we will get another round of PPP. But in the meantime, anybody who has received it and hasn't spent it and is transitioning to the company or they did spend it and they need to figure out this forgiveness process, it's... There's nothing solidified on how that process is going to work. I would uh, advise you to speak to the lender who gave you that PPP financing and, and start to work with them on how to navigate that process at that particular point. Because it could be different from the next one. Yeah, there are quite a few... Uh what appear to be little things that show up due to the last six months um, that you know tend to crop up in different deals in different ways, and so that's one of them that has been pretty prevalent because I think most companies um, took advantage of, of that federal assistance. So. Another thing, real quick, I want to mention in regards to this, Michelle, and for sellers that are thinking about selling, back to that that creative slide you mentioned. Being creative in this time is is uh, a big differentiator in, in helping people get deals done. It's how we're closing a lot of transactions even outside the box. One thing that's attractive to buyers taking over your company could be EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster. If you haven't applied for EIDL money or haven't taken it, that buyer can't. Or you can apply, same thing, for that loan and possibly transition it over to them. It can be working capital that they have coming out the gates. Uh, we were doing this on a, on a deal in Southern California in the summertime where that was one of the, the big things for them taking over that business. If they were going to come in, apply for EIDL money, get that plus PPP, and all of a sudden they've got three hundred plus thousand dollars in, in working capital right out the gates, um, outside of any permanent working capital they can get from a bank but, or an operating line. You know, similar to the deal we outlined earlier of the buyers picking off the receivables of the of the seller, getting permanent working capital, and an operating line of credit could have up to a million dollars in, in working capital out the gate taking over that company. I mean, these are things that a lot of bankers even won't, won't be advising their clients on or thinking. They're just thinking transactions. You know, how do I close this deal? 
oh, thank God the underwriter approved it. <laughs> Let's not ask for anything else, right? But as long as you can explain it, why um, you would need this permanent working capital and how you're going to put it to use and, and how it's going to help with the continued success of this business, banks can get behind that. You know, I worked in the Great Recession and had a large portfolio of clients. One of them was a, a plumbing company that a lot of you today are probably very familiar with, but at the time they were fairly small. And this particular owner had, I don't know, $180,000 to their name. And they had to make a decision, you know, do we just scale back like a lot of our competitors do? Or what if I took 100,000 of this 180 I have left and put it all into marketing, marketing and advertising to try to capture market share? You know, can we win? <clears throat> they took that gamble, they took that bet. And today you see them on buses and <laughs> trucks all over the place. They're one of the largest plumbing companies in our state. They did very well by taking that risk, but it was a calculated risk. You know, I remember talking through that with them and going, okay, you know, if you're going to do this, we got to think worst case scenario, best case scenario, assume the worst, hope for the best. You got to be ready for all of it and have your plans from A to Z, you know, on how you're going to move forward, whether this works or it doesn't. And, and they had a very well thought out plan, talked to all their advisors, banking being one of them, tax, legal, you name it. And uh, they executed uh, to perfection and did very, very well. We are seeing other businesses do that now. Do I just scale back? Do I close my doors? Do I, do I grow through acquisition? I mean, there's so many things that we're seeing out there in the business world right now. It gets us excited because it's not all doom and gloom. It's not, you know, is it difficult? Yes, <laughs> but there is opportunity. You just have to be willing to, to listen and look and recognize these opportunities. And you may not as a business owner have time to recognize all these you're trying to navigate this mess and run your business. But if you have a team of advisors, hopefully you can lean on, lean on them to help recognize you. That's what we're here to help. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So. Well, um, with that being said, <clears throat> our next and last slide. This may be your big opportunity to grow right now. Like I mentioned, grow through acquisition. It, it's something to, to really think about. And I hope this resonates with some of you on this, you know, on this call, on this presentation, listening. Think outside the box. This may be your time to capture market share and grow your business. And it doesn't mean that if you do that, you can't ex exit in the not too distant future. You can make an acquisition today and still exit next year. And it could double or triple the valuation on your business. Like I mentioned earlier, those folks that are the minnow swallowing the whale, you know, buying two, two industry competitors, uh, they are going to significantly increase the valuation on, on their business. And who knows? They, they may hit that even a number of $3 million plus, and now all of a sudden, they're on the radar of all kinds of private equity deals. And once you exceed a $3 million EBITDA <clears throat> in the private equity world, valuations jump sometimes from 7 to 8 times to 11 to 15. You know, that's a big jump. And now, you know, these folks that were the, the, the small player at the table got, could recognize a very, very large exit if they decide to, to move. You know, they can continue business, you know, uh, business as usual, but they're going to start having people knock on their door once they're hitting those numbers going, hey, uh, you know, would you entertain an exit? And now they have all the leverage. So this may be your opportunity to grow right now. Like I said, it's not all doom and gloom. Any final questions on the way out here? Yeah, so we can stay on for, for a few minutes after uh, we wrap up here in case someone wants to ask a question um, to Rasan or, or me. Um, wanted to also highlight to you the upcoming programs that we have. As many of you know, Equinox hosts these every month, um, trying to really focus on areas of interest to businesses as they grow and change. On uh, November 19th, we have Avoiding Landmines in Hiring. You know, the hiring landscape is, is really unique right now as folks shift to thinking solely about local hiring and looking even more broadly to hiring um, out of state because with the learnings that we've had about working from home and working remotely, there's no reason to just have everybody who has to come into the office. So Avoiding Landmines in Hiring covers that as well as a number of other uh, topics. 
um, that are both, you know, standard grounded employment law items as well as new, newly discovered things that are coming out of the uh, pandemic. And then December 10th, Trends for the Future, really looking at um, the areas of law that are, that are changing and growing, privacy being one, um, some of the employment law items as well are on that, on that list. So we'll be sending those out to you and I look forward to seeing you at those events in the future.